something we offer in consecrated life for our time if we are but willing to be opened. Welcome. We open our Center for the Study of Consecrated Life here at Catholic Theological Union during the papacy of a pope from a religious order who listening to requests from many in religious life and from the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and the Societies of Apostolic Life proclaim this year to the, be the year of consecrated life. In Evangelio Gaudium, Pope Francis invites us all, quote, at this very moment, to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to be willing to let him encounter them. I ask all of you to do this unfailingly each day. And then the Pope assures us that, quote, the joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Hence our theme also here for the year, Encounter and Quentero. Pope Francis proclaims this year on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, and Perfecte Caritatis, decree on the adaptation and renewal of religious life, along with the closing of Vatican Council II and the beginning of the living of its call. Vatican II was also a wake up the world and the church, as part of the world was also to be awakened there moment in time. We are now at what I tend to call Vatican II plus 50. And in this room, we have the blessing of both persons who experienced the period of the council and who have been deeply shaped and formed by the council. The start of this institution is part of that. And those who have only been born since the council and many in between. And the call of our God to encounter continues across generations. And this time in 2015. What a wonderful beginning to our year. As Bob also said, Pope Francis, in naming the three aims of this year, identifies looking to the past with gratitude, living the present with passion, and embracing the future with hope. I sense that we easily enough can look to the past with gratitude. I do see so many around me here and beyond living the present with passion. You're here. Yet I sense that at times we are a bit reticent to embrace the future with hope. We see the world around us. We see religious life. And you've heard some of the pieces of that. We see consecrated life, new or not so new, and its challenges. And here at CTU, we are part of a global community asking these questions about hope. We do sense there is going to be some dying and we don't know how we will go through and manage all the changes and shifts that are already upon us. We're just not too sure about it. Ah, such, in fact, is the nature of hope. I think perhaps this is why I was invited to speak about hope. We want to, as St. John Paul II wrote in Vita Consecrata, look to the future where the Spirit is sending you in order to do even greater things. Yet, perhaps we also refrain, how can this be? We do desire to live, as Pope Francis says, quote, as witnesses of a different way of doing things, of acting, of living. It is possible to live differently in this world, unquote. This, that it's possible to live differently in this world is a realization ever more people are having. I took not long ago a MOOC course, massive open online course, yes your faculty do take classes, um, on social transformation and slightly bigger than our classes there were 22,000 people in it <laughs> and all were saying we must find another way to live on this planet together economic, political, and educational systems are failing, religious traditions are struggling, the environment as we're living in it is not sustainable. 
And even as we speak, uh, ECOSOC is meeting at the UN, UNESCO. So we are not alone in realizing some things are dying and will have to be let go. We have something to offer here, if we but dare. This is a time of tremendous possibility and opportunity, if we but dare surrender to God, to love. Timothy Radcliffe wrote us a note a few weeks ago here at the center, and he says, thank you for doing this. Religious life needs a revitalization. We can all participate in this. The we is each of us, here, now. A few years ago, I wrote about crossing thresholds. And at the time, I sensed many of us were just getting at the doorway. I sense we are at it, now, on it, and perhaps stepping across it. And in fact, we are in the process of leaving a lot that cannot go through the threshold and actually that only inhibits us from the encounters inviting. When the theme of this year at CTU for the Year of Consecrated Life was to be encounter or, or encuentro, the words hope and encounter started working through me, in me. And I'm realizing that encounter is a key marker of hope and the layers of encounter are important. I sense one layer in particular is calling to us in consecrated life at this time. So, in order to do so, I will start with hope, offer a definition, and then offer four markers of hope. I will then move to encounter and four layers of encounter. And from there, some of the gifts that Encounter offers us. And I will close with two invitations, some images, but two invitations in particular for consecrated life at this time. Hope. Here I'm talking about hope is a virtue. Hope is a virtue, and in such, it fits under the greatest virtue, which is love. A virtue is a disposition and habit which flows out of who we are and who we want to become. And it offers us a vision of how we get there. Virtues are teleological, that is, there's a goal or an end toward which they strive. In Christianity, the ultimate end is union with God. And we live out this desire on a daily basis through our love of God, neighbor, and self. Throughout our lives, we strive towards this telos or end, and as long as we live, our task is not complete. Virtues, like our human nature, are also dynamic. As we continue to learn, grow, and mature, so our level of understanding and depth of living the virtues evolve. Hope gives us a particular sustained moral and spiritual vision. In addition, it's the transcendent virtue that animates and informs the virtues which follow. Hope not only gives us the vision, it sanctions and sustains the vision. Christian hope tells us what type of vision we have. Hope is also a prime Christian resource of the imagination. Hope offers a horizon for our expectations in both tangible and non-tangible ways. And hope allows us to reshape our reality in a particular way. We begin this reshaping grounded in our first marker of hope. The count context of hope is that it is grounded in reality. Even as hope provides a horizon for our expectations, a person of hope is firmly grounded in reality, a reality in which movement forward is not easy to obtain, yet within the realm of possible options. The reality toward which hope leans is that of the wounded heart of humanity and the wounded earth. Hope looks at reality through the lens of gospel faith and points to areas in need. Describing hope is rooted in reality not easy to obtain, yet within the realm of possible options flows from a reading of Thomas Aquinas' look at the virtue of hope. 
So hope is not pie in the sky, inattentive to the realities present. Catholic social encyclicals begin with a wide-eyed look at reality around us. It's the standard format for bringing our faith to a situation. I cannot hope for peace in the city of Chicago if I do not realize that within a few miles of where I live, we have some of the highest gun rape violence in this country. And I need to know why this is so. So we look at the second a bit more. We look for hope when what we are looking at seems virtually impossible. Impassable. We are in the midst of la lucha, the struggle, and just can't see our way beyond it. It's only in those virtually impossible places that we actually ask for hope. At the same time, we hope not only for what we think or imagine or long to be possible, we only do it when we think it might, might have a chance. If there's no chance at all, we do not hope. Even a 1% chance is hope. We actually only lament because we hope, because we believe the future could be other than what the present is. That is the book of Lamentations. When we have no hope, we despair. Nothing says this is going to be easy or that we will not suffer. We have the cross as our symbol. It is the long haul often enough, yet there are sparks that indicate something is possible. Hope here invites an encounter. These realities will invite the encounter, but we still need one more place, one more piece, one more marker, and that's openness. Often the openness in us occurs because we don't know what else to do or because we have nowhere else to turn. If you remember the movie Romero, the dramatization of Oscar Monsignor, soon to be saint, we hope, um, his life and his death, there's this one scene where he just goes up to this, this hillside with, full of trash and everything. And his line there is, I can't, you must. I can't, you must. When we are seeking our way, we pray to be opened. And here we are praying for interior freedom realizing that our ways of seeing are not complete and we need help. It's in this stance of openness that we find our radical dependence on God. We beg God, and at some point we let go into God, always, not always realizing that in surrendering we are letting go really into love. Liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez says contemplation is ultimately a state of radical self-giving and receiving. We surrender to love. We surrender to mystery. In radical dependence on God, we open ourselves further towards encounter, not only to God, but to one another and to all of God's creation. And here I would say our contemplative life is what helps us encounter all those layers encounter God's love in the wounds of the world. Now, the last point here is going to go actually both places, both openness and fostered in community. We hope, we hope is communal. We do so together. And once we have some spark, we also need one another. So hope is fostered in community. And that is one of the gifts we can offer a world in need of that sense of belonging and really that, that sense that Pope or Francis is talking about when he says we should be as experts in communion. We learn some of that in community. Now to encounter. And again, first allow me to define the word a bit and then offer four layers. On the one hand, in English and from its origins, encounter is an unexpected or casual meeting with, some, meeting with someone. It can also mean to unexpectedly experience or be faced with something difficult or hostile. The word, however, has grown in meaning and use, particularly in various cultures. That's um, why I love the word encuentro. It's, it just has so much more in it. 
Our Pope Francis has also helped move this further into our lexicon. In December of 2013, Vatican analyst and reporter John Allen wrote that all popes tend to have a couple of catchphrases they invoke time after time. And so at some point we start saying what is it that they're thinking and what word comes forth. And perhaps his core signature phrase is the culture of encounter. The Pope invoked this term at a year-end audience with Italian diplomatic staff and the Italian Embassy of the Holy See. And he says, allow me to underline a perspective that I con consider very important. You are in a position to promote the culture of encounter. Your diplomatic personnel and all of your work is designed to allow representatives of countries, international organizations, and institutions to encounter one another in the most effective way. How important is this service? John Allen says, like many sound bites, the culture of encounter is elastic enough to embrace a wide range of possible meanings. But in general, Francis seems to intend the idea of reaching out, fostering dialogue, and friendship, even outside the usual circles. Think about our discussion just earlier. And he makes a special point of encountering people who are neglected and ignored by the wider world. The culture of encounter, Alan says, is such a defining idea for Francis that saying somebody's part of it is almost the highest praise he can bestow. In May of 2013, the leaders of the Folklore movement joined Francis for his morning mass, and afterwards one of them spoke to the Pope, telling him that the prayers of all the Folklorini are with him, and that they're committed to going out and building bridges with others. Francis replied immediately, that's just what we need, the culture of encounter. I've been playing with, working with, pondering encounter for some time now, and I sense more and more that with hope and encounter, we might find through encounter the linchpin towards some change, transformation, and deeper hope. And in working, I've identified four layers, whoops, four layers, four layers, there they are, four layers of encounter. But I must say at the outset that these don't necessarily happen in this order. However, there are layers in this spiral that move us and move social change as well. And they can both move consecrated life and give us direction for movement. They are, as I like to say, deceptively simple until we begin to live the encounter. The first layer. The first layer of encounter is to see to stop and see, to see the other, person or earth community, to look the reality in the eye long enough to let some things sink in, perhaps sink in, to see all that we can. This is like the context of hope rooted in reality, but here we stop or at least pause now to see more. It's more than a glance at the headlines. It's beyond, hello, how are you, and we keep walking. It's realizing the faces around us, beginning to see faces perhaps we have not yet seen. This puts us on margin somewhere. We've heard the reality with facts data. Now there's a pause. Something makes us stop, and it isn't necessarily comfortable. Often, it's necessarily uncomfortable. And in consecrated life, we're, we are called to go to these places. As Bob was talking, also to the existential peripheries. And pause. And we'll hear much. Theologian Martha Zeichmeister, teaching at the UCA, the University of Central America, writes about the authority of those who suffer and calls us to such an encounter, even in the title. Lillian Sueco from the Congo, also poignantly, makes us stop and see what's happening in her country and the surrounding areas she engages. Such an encounter can build possibilities for further common cause 
even in unexpected places. The second layer of encounter is to see the unexpected. The first layer, as difficult as it is, is interrupted by another layer. In this layer, you see differently than what you had anticipated. Even in the midst of horror, you notice something different. You notice disconnects. And we're often upended here, and we find ourselves realizing and desiring to enter more deeply into God. We don't understand, but we're willing. A powerful example of this that a number of us here in this room experienced in September was with scholar Emmanuel Katongale. Some of you were here. He is someone of both Rwandan background and Ugandan background who was working, struggling with the genocide in Rwanda 20 years ago. And he writes, among other areas, on Christian imagination, social imagination in Africa. I share here what he read to us that day from the narrative of Father Zachary Bukuru, who was rector at the time of the attack in Burundi. This is the second layer. He says, in the context of endless cycles of violence, African Christians keep wondering, does Christian faith make any difference? What kind of difference? And he says, I argue that Christianity does indeed make a difference, but that for Christian faith to offer a radical interruption to the endless cycles of violence in Africa, it has to be grounded within an explicit missiological vision of Ephesian identity and communities. And the story. The story of the 40 young students of Buta provides a most illuminating example of Ephesian community. In the early hours of the morning in the fall of 1997, a militia group headed by a fierce woman commander attacked the Buta, a high school seminary. They roused the students from their sleep and ordered the high school students to separate. Hutus on one side, Tutsi on the other. Three times the order was given, but the students refused to separate. So the commander ordered the rebels to open fire. The students fell and others tried to escape. In all, 40 students were killed. One of the students who had been wounded ran to the rector's house and called for the rector to open the door for him. When the rector opened the door, the boy dashed inside the small house and gasping for breath told the rector, Father, we have won. They told us to separate and we refused. We have won. And he collapsed and died. His lecture was stunning and the narrative is part of this interruption. Even at dinner that evening, it was clear in his eyes that he was working with, struggling with the realities, hoping for Ephesian communities and reckoning with the violence around him and all of us. Yet still, the encounter is moving him and us. It's why we write. It's why we engage. It's what moves us. Encounters wherever they are, in whatever our ministry, move us and call us. And while not all are so stunning, we all have encounters in which we see what we don't expect and that keep us wondering. This is where hope encounters us if we are but willing, open, if we ask to be opened. Something about these times also open us. Cracking open the veneer of busyness, superficiality, and as theologians, our answers beg silence as well as response. The third level of encounter is when we can see the other with empathy and compassion. It's interesting that this level is more and more named as necessary for leadership in our time both for social change, someone like Peter Senge out of Sharmer, and for reconciliation and peace building, John Paul Lederach. To encounter means to be willing to see differently than what you had anticipated, to be willing to be encountered, 
also means to be who we are as we are. Perhaps in both, we encounter both strength and vulnerabilities we hadn't anticipated. And it helps us see differently ourselves and the other. Jim Keenan, talking about, he talks about mercy, but very connected to compassion, talks about mercy as a willingness to enter into the chaos of another's life. Cardinal Walter Casper, in a recent book, Mercy, the Essence of the Gospel and the Key to Christian Life, writes the compassion, or as one prefers to say empathy, the understanding that comes from feeling oneself in another's shoes, has become a new and important paradigm in modern psychology and psychotherapy, and pedagogy, sociology, and pastoral work. To be able to put oneself into the situation, into the feelings and thoughts and existential situation of another, in order to thereby understand his or her thinking and acting, is generally regarded today as the presupposition of successful interpersonal relationship and as proof of genuine humanity. To be able to put oneself into the feelings, thoughts, and existential situation of another culture and another people is moreover the basic presupposition of intercultural encounter, peaceful relations, and cooperation between religions and cultures, just as it is the basic presupposition of politics and diplomacy in the service of peace. But this, too, isn't so easy, we know. This past June, I was in England for a conference on Janet Erskine Stewart, an RSCJ, a major superior and an educator extraordinaire. And it was there that another educator, Phil Philomena Tiernan, made a distinct impression on me. She was there on a midi sabbatical in Europe and attended both gather gatherings, an academic conference and a pilgrimage. And I had what I later realized was my first encounter with her after a talk we heard on religious life. And over tea, we were in England, it was tea, she wanted to know what I thought. And I told her, and we spoke, and with others. And at the end of it, she told me, you need to do more with this. And she was very interested in this center. And it was only a few weeks later that I had a stunning, interruptive encounter. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I like social media. But before this, the last time I wrote on my Facebook page was eight months earlier, uh, when I met Leonardo Boff. So it had to be something. But I needed to write this and the prayer that welled in me. I have not posted on Facebook for a very long time. It's time to post again. I want to share a photo of an amazing person I recently met at the Janet Erskine Stewart conferences in England this summer. Her name is Phil Turnin. She's a religious of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a member of my community. And over the next days, I would like to share a bit of what her life is teaching me and her death, and to offer some simple reflections on this public, ecclesial, and global moment. This Sister Phil Tiernan is one of the people killed when the Malaysian Airlines jet was shot down this past week over the Ukraine. Phil is in the middle. This was the last photo I took on my phone, a selfie I am grateful for. Phil's face says it all. I had an amazing series of conversations with her. It was such a gift to have time with her. I loved being around her. We talked about religious life and what we see around us, what is being called for today. She encouraged me to mourn. Her whole being exuded encouragement, and she wanted to keep in touch. I wept when I heard she was on the plane that was shot down. My heart is sad, broken, and now she is teaching me about the sacred heart of Jesus, who loved greatly and fully, and whose heart is one with the wounded heart of humanity and the wounded earth. I am heading off to Sunday liturgy shortly, and I keep hearing, this is my body, this is my blood, given for you in love. And Jesus did and does, and Phil did and does, 
Now over a war-torn and bloodied landscape with the blood from the world on it evermore. Phil lived our in call and invitation to discover and reveal God's love. She's not done. Phil is inviting us all, and so is our God who loves and weeps with us. We are being called. In the following, six following posts, and again, it was more than I had probably posted in years, I found myself connected with the people on the plane, the people on the ground in Ukraine and Russia, the persons who built the missile and those who launched it, and those whose blood is also on the ground there. It was not and is not easy. I found myself praying on Facebook, of all places, from the second post on, to be open, to be opened, begging that. And in the midst of realities, this third layer, compassion and mercy, this third companion of the companions of passion and mercy, which are justice and truth, must also have spaces to be encountered. John Paul Lederach and others, including well, Cardinal Casper, speak to this. And here again, we hear from Cardinal Casper, we must hear in compassion the word passion. This means discerning the cry for justice, as well as making a passionate response to the appalling unjust relationships existing in our world. It's only now that I'm beginning to understand a document from one of my community uh, places looking at lifelong formation that says, you know, what is it that we're called for when we're called to look at things with the heart? And yet there is a fourth layer. And I'm working still on language for this, but for now I call it generative encounter or even transformative encounter. And this is what I sense deeply is calling us in consecrated life today and wider. The fourth level, this is where God moves in, moves us, and creates something new. That line from Isaiah, see, I am creating something new. Can you not see it? It is in this space of encounter that generates the new. This can take some time, and in our language, we would say it requires listening, prayer, meditation, contemplation. It is transformative because indeed, indeed it does change us first and foremost. It also changes how we see what is possible. And here we're getting to hope. The more we have practices in our life, prayer, the more we become radically disposed to see and to change towards disponibilidad, that radical availability that says, yes, God, anything. It is this kind of encounter that in, it is in this kind of encounter that we can experience dialogue that colleagues Steve Bevins and Roger Schroeder wrote about in their important book on prophetic dialogue. And scripture scholar Lori Brink writes about uh, in terms of biblical foundations of prophetic dialogue. She calls it, quote, dialogue that is itself prophetic, revelatory to each participant. While not easy, this encounter calls forth the best in us and usually to new horizons of hope. Yet this requires a contemplative stance that is open and willing to move, to risk, to respond, to create. This is exactly where we are in consecrated life today. Whether it's a new movement or a group that's been around for a thousand years, this is exactly where we are in this space. It's trusting that in the creating, we walk and see as we go. And openness is so key here. Carmelite scholar Connie Fitzgerald writes about purification towards the dawn of hope. And she uses John of the Cross to talk about letting go of all else but God here. She calls it a space of really de-linking. De-linking or holding lightly to all we think we already know or all that we're holding on to, all of our accolades as members of consecrated life and our wounds from being investigated to sex abuse scandals and more. That it's only when we open ourselves and let those in, let God into those spaces, which will often create silence in us and open that silence. 
that God can move us. If we can't open ourselves to such hope, to the best of ourselves and the world God is creating, hoping in us, this generative encounter creates, imagines, flows. Now, one of the things about this space that gets uncomfortable is that while we can name this space of encounter, and there are different names, ways of naming it, we can't interpret it yet. We can only point right now. We can see some of what is emerging from this space of encounter. And creativity and imagination do flow from this space. And we could talk about this later, but we are most ourselves in this place. Consecrative life is most at its root and where it's being called. And there's a unity of vision. What Dr. Paul Farmer and Gustavo Gutierrez call one world, not first, second, or third world, or fourth world, one world. And the response, no wonder the Pope is talking about joy. The response that flows from the space is joy and gratitude. It is a mystical encounter. And lest we think that we just sit there, this way of being, this generative encounter, the imagination and creativity ultimately moves us to act, to risk, to try. As in the beginning, our congregations, our institutes, our movements did. We are in the midst of this and it is calling us to attentiveness. Consecrated life is being called to this to open ourselves to this as we are being transformed. And notice, so is much of church and society right now. And I believe we can offer spaces here. For while it is uncomfortable terrain, we know it. And we can remember it. As I found myself, after Phil Ternan's death, using scriptural images, as well as earth images, and our own documents, so too we offer this. In my small group of the MOOC course, which is five people from India, Germany, Netherlands, Canada and the United States, when we were asked to do generative images, those are what came forth naturally as we were all creating something. And here I say, we all have a charism that speaks to our time. Offering it for this time is part of the evolution of charism. Yet there's more. We're called to offer to hold the spaces for such encounters as we are going through them. We need not be in charge, and this is hard for us. We need not to be in charge in the midst of them. We're called to be present. Remember, doing, moving faster doesn't move us at the tectonic level we are being encountered at present. In fact, it only distracts us from seeing what is there. Here again, perhaps instead of surrender or open to God, we might think of opening to love here. And this is about the reign of God. It moves us towards that. And it is. It's Paschal. And it is worth our very lives and it may call us. Today is the 10-year anniversary of the martyrdom of Sister Dorothy Stang in the Amazon. And we also have one of our own martyrs, an alum here, Father John, amid the people of Mexico, who was found in a mass grave. So we know the cost of this. But we're asked to witness this by our very lives. And we have images. And I'm going to close with just three brief images. And we could talk about them later. I won't develop them there. But um, I often have been thinking about Mark's Gospel 6, 31 to 44. All of you in scripture class know that one. But the rest, when I needed a reminder, it's the feeding of the 5,000. We know Jesus and the encounter, we know the disciples, but I just invite you to reflect a bit, and I won't do it here. But they were the ones, the people, were encountered. And I would say not only was everyone fed, but think about it, if you heard something that amazing, if you heard love like that and saw it, why would you want to leave? Would you not want to stay there? What happened when all those people from different towns walked that long way to the deserted place is they sat down together and created community and talked about what moved them probably. So I just wonder what more can be opened up there as part of the gifts. A second image is nature. Now we are in Chicago in winter, 
And this is Lake Huron in winter last year. It was a little cold last year. So what is it that we see in beauty? You might say you can't Maria kayak in February on Lake Huron. And that is very true. But I can see 100 yards out a sunset that's spectacular. So beauty right now is part of what feeds that generative encounter in us. But I also, I also think our artists in other ways have something to teach us here. And I'm wondering if we opened up to art what more it can offer. I'm reminded that the artists around us and in us create what is not yet seen, speak what is not yet heard, and sing what we do not yet hear. One of our students from Vietnam say, what would it look like if Vietnam were really united with the founder, with the spirit? That's an image that offers our generative encounter opportunities. That's one level. The other level is he also is working, volunteering at back of the yards, teaching people at, young people at risk how to wood carve. You see, it creates more than what we can imagine. And it flows from the founder's vision in places you have no idea. Okay? And music as well can do that. So my invitation to you is to create two, two things. To create spaces for encounters in ourselves, our communities, and beyond, within groups and beyond the groups that you know. Again, not that we have to know what will come from them. That is not ours. The people are seeking this in the world, and we can simply ask the people, engage, invite, and create generatively together. And the second is to open spaces for our charism to lead us for our time, for our time. So I close where I began. There is something we offer in consecrated life for our time if we are but willing to be opened. This hope leads us to embrace encounters and gener opens us to generativity, to embrace the future with hope, so that with 1 Peter 3.15, we too can, quote, make our defense to anyone who asks of us for an accounting for the hope that is in us. Amen? Amen.